So uh, we will tackle now the um, topic of international data transfer. And here uh, you have the plan of my presentation. So you see that after some general reminders, point one and two, I will focus on some topics. Uh, some topics first that have been clarified uh, recently by guidelines. Uh, we have heard a lot uh, um, uh, via the EDPB. And then on, and so it's code of conduct and, but it's a partial uh, clarification, code of conduct and certification. And some topics that are uh, actually pending. It is the SHREM 2 case and the issue of the standard contractual clause that I used for the transfer to the US. It's um, uh, the privacy shield, the review of the privacy shield, the um, endless story of the Brexit, and last but not least, the last development in data protection in India and uh, China. Um, so, um, as you know, and it was repeated uh, this morning, um, the GDPR is not really uh, a, um, a revolution, it's just an evolution. But um, concerning uh, data transfer, as you know, there is, you will never find a legal definition of transfer or international transfer or transfer to, the ter to a third country in the GDPR, neither in the directive. So I believe that the most illuminating um, definition concerning transfer and uh, transfer to third country was in fact given by the EDPS in a position paper concerning the transfer from the EU institution to international organization or to third countries. And according to this definition, the transfer, a transfer is a communication, disclosure, or otherwise making available of personal data conducted with, and that's important, knowledge or intention of a sender subject to the regulation that the recipient will have access to it. And um, I have highlighted the, the word knowledge and intention because these are the words uh, and you will not find them in the, in the GDPR, but these are the important criteria to qualify a processing in a transfer. And these criteria, and it was already said also by uh, Vojek, in fact, this is the, 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 um, the, the case law. It, it, very often the solution comes from the case law, and the solution here comes from an old case in 2003, the Lingfist case. And in this case, the Court of uh, Justice of European Union deducted that there was no transfer of personal data to a third country because there was no intention to buy the sender to transfer uh, the data to recipient. It was a, a, a case concerning a website and you, you are all confronted with this kind of case. And here the delineating line is really the uh, knowledge or intention. This said, you have to pay attention when reading this uh, definition uh, to the fact that uh, based on this definition, you may have the impression sometimes that you are in a case of transfer, uh, but in reality, it's just a case of direct application of the GDPR according to Article 3.2. Um, I will skip Article 3.1. I will go directly to Article 3.2. So this regulation applies to the processing of personal data of data subjects who are in the Union by a controller or processor not established in the Union where the processing activities are related to the offering of goods or service in the Union or the monitoring of the behavior as far as the behavior take place within the Union. So it's the, the case of um, Alibaba, for example, the Chinese Amazon, who is targeting the Chinese community here in Europe, even in Chinese, for the offering of goods or, um, or, or service, or who is uh, monitoring uh, the behavior. 
So um, it, this was also um, already said uh, concerning international data transfer, uh, nothing has changed really. You have still the, the same uh, priority. So you, you um, adequacy decision, appropriate safeguard, and uh, derogation uh, allowed for specific situation. Uh, but there were some improvements that were uh, brought uh, by um, the GDPR and in fact that were brought before the GDPR by the case law and it's the frame one case except uh, the first point, the clear focus on certain third countries. So I will immediately go to the first point, the clear focus uh, concerning um, the third countries. The EU Commission explained that now there is a policy concerning the list of countries that the EU Commission will uh, put for, for review. And in the communication of 2017, uh, 17, um, the, the, the Commission uh, has highlighted the, um, the following um, criteria. Uh, first, the extent of commercial relationship that the EU has with the country, the extent of data flows, the pioneering role of the third country that could serve as model for its region, and the overall political relationship, common values, share objectives. So right now there is really a policy to include some country in the list for review. So that's a contribution from uh, the EU Commission. For the rest, it's a contribution from the GDPR, but that is coming from the frame case. So the first thing is the clear criteria to grant an adequacy decision to a third country. It's Article 45.2. So there are three criteria to grant an adequacy decision, and it's coming directly from the frame case. It's the rule of law and the fact that there is um, um, effective administrative and uh, judicial redress, the effective functioning of a supervisory authority, and the international commitments taken by the country. And Sophie um, explained this uh, morning that, of course, uh, in the recital of the GDPR, Convention 108 and now Convention 108, Plus is one of the criteria to grant uh, an adequacy uh, decision. Third thing that is coming directly from um, the Schrem case and that is written now in black letter in the GDPR is the fact that there is a clear mechanism for periodic review uh, of the adequacy decision every four years and uh, this review can lead to the repeal, amendment, or suspension of the decision. That's also something that was brought by uh, the Schrem case. Based on all these criteria, and it was already mentioned this morning, J Japan, despite the fact that uh, Japan is not a member of Convention uh, 108, obtained an adequacy decision, and some other countries are in the pipeline and the review will be done according to these criteria that are now in black letter in the GDPR or in the communication of um, the uh, Commission. Concerning the improvement um, regarding appropriate safeguard, one of the main improvements that was uh, brought by the GDPR and that is also coming from uh, the Schrem case, it's Article 46.1. Um, um, and it's a new condition. It's a condition of enforceable right and effective legal remedies. And in fact, this condition means that the safeguard used must provide those rights or, but it's a fact, it's an end in my opinion, the third country must guarantee those right, that those rights are enforceable. So in other words, it means that the mere use of an appropriate safeguard as such is not enough if those rights are not guaranteed by the third country. And I will uh, explain that in more detail later with the Schrem II case. 
Uh, another improvement that was brought by the GDPR concerning the appropriate safeguard is the fact that um, there is an harmonization concerning the authorization and approval regime for uh, appropriate uh, safeguard. And in fact, the, the system is not only harmonized, but it's also lighter. For example, for the old standard contractual clause, no uh, standard data protection clause, you don't need an authorization. The same for the use of binding corporate rule, even though the binding corporate rules themselves uh, need to be approved by the authority, but for the use, you don't need an authorization. And that was a, a problem that we met in the past with Portugal, where it was impossible to obtain an authorization from uh, the supervisory authority because Portugal uh, deny uh, the use of uh, BCR. So that's um, the main, in my opinion, um, improvement uh, concerning the adequacy uh, decision and appropriate safeguard. So here, just to refresh your mind, uh, I've listed for the private sector um, the appropriate safeguard, and I will go directly uh, to uh, uh, code of conduct, so one of the topics for which we have recent clarification. Um, in fact, code of conducts are not entirely new. Uh, they were already regulated under Article 27 of the Directive as general instrument to reach and evidence uh, compliance to the, the Directive. What the GDPR has done is to, to give a new dimension uh, to, 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 to code of conducts. And um, so um, the EDPB has uh, just published general gu guidelines for code of conduct uh, in January of uh, this year. So these general uh, guidelines apply for all of code of conduct, but we are waiting the specific guidelines concerning uh, code of conduct as a tool uh, for transfer and uh, according to Isabel Verreken, uh, with some reserve, uh, they will be maybe published uh, after uh, the summer. Um, concerning the approval of the code of conduct in general, um, uh, the code of conduct must be approved by a supervisory authority when it concerns a processing in one member state, but when it concerns a processing in several member states, it's uh, up to the EU Commission to uh, provide general validity by, uh, via Implementing Act. What is important is that for transfer, it's only these last codes uh, that allow transfer to importers that are not subject to the GDPR. Concerning the, the mechanism of the code of uh, conduct for international transfer, this mechanism is quite simple. In fact, the data importer who is not subject to the GDPR has to adhere to the code of conduct and to subscribe um, uh, to a binding and unforeseeable commitment to apply the code of conduct for the benefit of the data subject. Um, concerning the code of conduct um, itself, um, it can be prepared by an association or another entity representing categories of controllers or processor, for example, trade association. And um, the association is uh, the owner, uh, is the code, the code owner. And near or inside this code owner, you have to have an external or internal uh, body that will be able to monitor uh, the compliance with uh, uh, the code. Um, the body must be accredited by a supervisory um, authority, and the body must um, uh, at least uh, demonstrate, and maybe there will be in the new guidelines, new uh, uh, requirement, but according to the GDPR, uh, the body must uh, be at least demonstrate uh, its independence, absence of conflict of its interest and expertise in data protection. 
Concerning independence and absence of conflict of interest, if you have a code owner and inside a body with part of the code owner, it means that you have to build Chinese walls in order to Chinese wall in order to guarantee the independence um, and the absence of conflict of interest of uh, the, the body. It must establish also procedure to assess eligibility to apply the code, to monitor compliance, to carry out reviews of the code operation, and um, it must establish procedure to handle complaints about infringement of uh, the code. Um, the certification, certification are now regulated by the GDPR, and once again, uh, it's a general tool uh, to evidence uh, compliance, not just only for transfer. And once again, here, uh, the EDPB published some guidelines. It was in January 2018, but they were reviewed and uh, updated in January 2019. And again, here we are waiting the specific guidelines uh, concerning certification as tool as transfer. It will be also probably for after uh, the summer. Uh, there is no definition of certification in the GDPR. It's, uh, you will find the definition um, that was written by the International Standard Organization, but it's short, you, you can, uh, it's of course a, a, a third party conformity assessment. Um, concerning the, the, the mechanism of the certification, well, it's uh, quite similar to the code of conduct. Uh, the importer uh, has to take um, a, a commitment that he will respect the certification in favor of the data subject, even though he is not uh, regulated by the GDPR. Uh, concerning the issuance of uh, certification, the certification are issued by either um, accredited certification bodies or by the competent supervisory authority. When it's uh, the accreditation come from, um, when it's a certification body, there are two systems that can be cumulative. Uh, the certification body can be accredited by a supervisory authority or and by the uh, regulation concerning the certification of bodies. When the criteria of certification are approved by the EDPB, um, and it's in black letter in the GDPR, we are uh, talking about the European Data Protection um, Seal. So this said, when the uh, certification, uh, when it's a certification by a supervisory authority, uh, you have to bear in mind that um, for the supervisory authority, the certification remains a faculty. It's not a mandatory uh, task. And in fact, a supervisory authority as a certification body can make different choice concerning the certification process. The, um, the um, supervisory authority can, for example, decide that it will be uh, the owner and the actor of the whole processing or that it will delegate some part, for example, the issuance of the certificate uh, or the assessment uh, to uh, um, uh, um, an external body. The point of attention is that, of course, when you have a supervisory authority uh, which is um, um, issuing uh, certification, uh, you have to pay attention that there is also, once again, a Chinese wall between the activity of certification and the uh, activity of um, uh, controlling uh, the, the controllers. Otherwise, you have uh, uh, an authority who will have a tendency to confirm that uh, it was for good reason that uh, the certification uh, was uh, uh, granted. Concerning the life of the certification, uh, the certification is granted for a maximum period of three years that can be, of course, renewed, and it can be withdrawn at any time. Uh, when the certificate is issued by the certification body, 
uh, the certification body must evidence uh, mutatis mutandis uh, the same as um, the, the body for um, uh, code of conduct. Uh, in this case, of course, the role of the certification body is to issue, review, renew, and redraw uh, certification. Uh, one point of attention is that the certification body has the duty to um, communicate to the supervisory authority the reason for granting or withdrawing the certification. Uh, there is nothing in the GDPR saying that um, the certification body has to communication the, the reason for non-granting, and so I believe that will be regulated by uh, national practices. So now I will tackle some pending topics, the first being the SREM2 cases. Uh, so SREM2 case. So this case is currently pending uh, before the Court of Justice of the European Union, and it relates to the referral for a preliminary ruling that relates to general question concerning the level of protection of the Directive 9546 and the notion of adequate level pro uh, protection, but mainly um, it raises specific question concerning the validity of data transfer to the US under standard contractual decision. Um, you will uh, remember that after uh, the invalidation of the Safe Harbor Trem 1 case, some US commercial companies, um, as Facebook, uh, replaced the former Safe Harbor protection by standard contractual clause. And so they did use the adequate uh, safeguard to try to guarantee the compliance of the transfer. Um, in short, the thesis of uh, Max Schrem here under the directive, but that will remain valid under the GDPR, is that the condition of enforceable rights and effective legal remedies is not guaranteed by the US when using standard contractual clause. So it's, it's basically the review of the US um, uh, American, uh, of the US um, um, legal um, system. So I don't believe that uh, in uh, this case, the, 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 the validity of the standard contractual clause um, is under threat, but the export uh, to the U.S. via the standard contractual clause is, I believe, um, under threat. Uh, privacy shield. Uh, well, the Commission has just published in uh, December 2018 uh, the second annual review, and uh, the Commission has spotted some concern, for example, uh, a concern concerning the, the proactive monitoring of compliance of the certified companies, the effectiveness of the tools to detect false claim, uh, the fact that there was still no appointment of a permanent privacy shield ombudsman. Um, in January, uh, the President Trump has uh, designated um, uh, 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 a new um, privacy shield um, uh, ombudsman, but the nomination is not yet uh, completed since the, the Senate uh, must um, take position on this. But, however, uh, despite this shortcoming, the, the, the Commission uh, came to the conclusion that the U.S. continue to assure an adequate level of protection for personal data uh, transfer under the privacy shield. The EDPS report also published uh, in January 2019 um, uh, is report and uh, the EDPB, sorry, and the EDPB acknowledged that uh, significant progress uh, were made, but um, it confirms also that the privacy shield continues to raise serious concern and you have uh, the list on um, on uh, the, 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 the slide, and among this list, of course, there are the issues pointed 
by the EU Commission, but at the end of the report, the EDPB, in a very diplomatic uh, language, language uh, recalls that the same concerns will be addressed by the course, by the court, and of course it's the Shrem 2 case, so the general review of uh, the American uh, system. So the next topic is of course the endless uh, story of uh, the, the Brexit, and here the big question is of course which kind of uh, egg, if I may say, the EU will receive uh, as an uh, Eastern gift from uh, the UK, uh, soft egg or hard egg? Um, well, all the bets are open um, <laughs> right now. Uh, but if it's a soft egg, well, uh, there will be, of course, uh, a transition uh, period, and so uh, all transfer will be allowed uh, for the period of the transition period. After uh, that, the question is, of course, well, what will happen next, the next level? Uh, well, sometimes you read that, well, there will be automatically an adequacy decision. I believe it was said this morning, uh, no, not automatically. There are some concerns, and uh, the EU Commission will have to respect all the criteria that are now listed in black letter in the GDPR, and uh, it's not a uh, uh, win that the UK will obtain um, an adequacy decision. If it's a hard egg, uh, well, the UK will become, of course, a third country. There, there, there is no specific remarks concerning appropriate safeguarded derogation, except concerning BCR, and there is also EDPB guidelines that were published on this. So it means for BCR that were already approved, and when the BCR are designated, uh, designate, uh, ICO, as lead supervisory authority, of course, um, uh, the group of undertaking will have to, to choose another uh, lead uh, supervisory authority, and the same applies uh, for uh, the BCR that are in the pipeline in front of ICO. Now, the new tigers um, of the digital economy, here you have all the logos of uh, the Indian and Chinese equivalent of the U.S. Uh, GAFAs. Um, and concerning this new tiger, you will probably remember the last spring testimony of Mark Zuckerberg during its audition before the U.S. Congress. Um, in substance, what he said is that if U.S tries to regulate Facebook and other GAFAs, U.S. will lose its hegemony in the digital economy, and that will benefit the Chinese tigers. Personally, I believe that this was, of course, a warning uh, to put pressure on the U.S. Congress, and that this statement was, uh, in fact, half true, because Anyway, whatever will happen concerning the regulation in the U.S. Uh, in the coming years, I believe that U.S. will lose its hegemony um, in the digital economy, whatever the decision. And it's an half true because the new tigers, and maybe this is by purely economic opportunism, but this new tiger are taking new direction in data protection. Uh, concerning India, you will remember that in August 2017, the Supreme Court of India upheld that privacy is a fundamental right. And the result of this ruling is that, that in, in less than one year, uh, India has prepared a draft of personal data protection bill which is close to the GDPR. Of course, there are some issues. 
Uh, but so the question here for India is what will be the next level, maybe in two years, three years, um, the Council of Europe will start some discussion uh, with India about uh, Convention 1008 plus. Concerning China, China was also very quick uh, in its reaction uh, during the last two years. In fact, China um, enacted the Chinese privacy law, which is a bundle uh, of uh, laws and administrative measures. And, it's, uh, and the last one is the data and transfer law that will come into force in 2019 this year. But the approach of China is a bit different from the approach of the GDPR or of uh, India. Here the center of gravity is not the fundamental right, it's not a fundamental right. The, the approach is the protection of consumer. So there is this big issue in China about trust. You have that not only for the um, data protection, but you have also that in the, for food safety, for example. But so that's the center of gravity that was taken by China. Of course, it's not the same as the GDPR. It's not perfect, but at least it's a direction that is taken by China. The problem with China is that you don't have only this center of gravity. You have another center of gravity. And this center of gravity is uh, coming from the government. And it's the fact that the government wants to continue to control the population. And so you know that, well, in China, you have millions of uh, surveillance uh, uh, camera and that the police, for example, is using uh, smart glasses uh, with uh, uh, facial recognition. You have also the system of uh, social uh, credit system that was created by Alibaba and that the government want to improve in order to manage uh, the population. So for China, um, it's more difficult to, to assess what will be the next level, but it's certain that the reaction of China was uh, very uh, quick. So my conclusion is that data transfer, of course, will remain a very fascinating, but also very challenging aspect of data protection fundamental right because among others some tools still need to be crafted and also it's very hard to predict the orientation that uh, some third countries uh, will uh, take and you have the example of uh, China. This said, this said um, I believe that to solve uh, uh, the, 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 the problem of an harmonized uh, level uh, of protection, and I'm advocating uh, like the, the speaker of uh, this morning, uh, Convention 108 um, plus is probably the, 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 the right tool uh, to find a new uh, balance. Uh, as, uh, as um, uh, at least as a true believer um, of data protection as fundamental right, this is my hope. Thank you very much for your attention.